For just a moment before we go to God's Word, I'd like to share two things with you because somebody got to church by way of delay and didn't hear the good news of the special meeting that's going on in Simi Valley Seventh-day Adventist Church in Lancaster Church starting at what time? Two o'clock. So let me ask you a question. Raise your hand if you're an elder. Raise your hand if you're a deacon. Raise your hand if you're a church officer of any type. Raise your hand if you're a church member. These meetings were planned just for you. So here's the plan. One o'clock we'll meet in the fireside room. If you want to drive, feel free to drive. Pick up a couple of friends, have a chat on the way over. There's a seminar at two. Three, a little lunch or a little supper. It won't be two or three. It'll be 3.30 probably. It's in your bulletin. And then one following that. Stay for as much as you can. If you can only stay for one, go for one. If you stay for all three, you'll be triply blessed. What time? What time do we meet? One o'clock. Fireside room following our, following our lunch. You'll be blessed. Oh! Wait a minute, I heard a little ping. I don't know if that was my phone or yours. Let me share just a, a joyous event. Karen and I were gone from, Oct I almost said February. <laughs> October, uh, October 2nd through last Monday. It's delightful to go back and see your aunt in Denver. Blue skies, but it was good to make that thousand mile drive back home on Monday. It's a joy because it was 80 miles an hour. The following day, I like these things. How about you? It went ping. I was going down the road and the, the, the magic of technology, the magic of technology, a photo popped in to my phone. Now, those of you that are of a generation before me, can't hardly do this thing. The, the phones, you know, we, we can work them. You would have to pull out your wallet and pull the picture out. But you can see the picture behind me. Let me explain for just a moment the joy that's in our heart. You see, we have six, Karen and I have six nieces and nephews, equally divided, three girls and three boys. We have two grand nephews, the first Cameron, Qualley, and his brother on the screen behind me. Caden, Miles, Qualley came into the world on Tuesday. Ladies want to know, nine pounds, eight ounces. I don't have the length. Already all decked out with hair. Lady in the picture is my sister, Diana, not the mother, um, but grandma. So I just share that joy with you as just a, a personal piece because we have a lot to be joyous for, don't we? And those of you that have grandchildren, children and grandchildren, you just know sometimes you just have to share. So uh, I do that this morning with a joyous heart. Let's pray together. Father, as we gather into your house to worship you, Lord, as we go to your word, we ask, Father, that from these sacred pages and your inspired writing, that you will, uh, you will place those words in our hearts, that we might assimilate them in our lives, that we might be transformed. So, Father, speak to us as we open our hearts, as we listen with our, our ears, Father, as we embrace that which you will provide for us just now. We ask in Christ's precious name. Amen. It would be a lot easier if as we became Christians, life would be easier, wouldn't it? How come it doesn't work that way? Sometimes things get difficult or impossible very quickly in life, don't they? I read this little clippy. It spoke of a police exam 
Imagine yourself taking this exam. You're out on patrol in the outer part of the city when an explosion occurs in a gas main in a nearby street. On investigation, now you're investigating, on investigation you find a large hole has been blown in the sidewalk. There's a van that's overturned nearby. Inside the van, there's a strong smell of alcohol. Both occupants, a man and a woman, are injured. You recognize the woman as the wife of your supervisor, who is presently away and out of the country. Uh, the husband of the, the woman is presently away and out of the country. A passing motorist stops to offer your assistance, and you realize that he is a man who's wanted for robbery. Suddenly a man runs out of a nearby house shouting that his wife is expecting a baby and that the shock of the explosion has made her birth imminent. Other, another man is crying for help, having been blown uh, into an adjacent river nearby by the explosion. Bearing in mind all of these events, now you are taking the test. In a few words, describe what actions you would take. Now the officer thought for a moment who was actually taking the test, picked up his pen and wrote, I would take off my uniform and mingle with the crowd and try not to be noticed. Would that we could do so under similar circumstances when life gets difficult. What do you do when life gets difficult and sometimes impossible? I've come to appreciate the word impossible. You see, I like good challenges. I like puzzles. I like mysteries. I like things, you know, the, the things that are easy to do, everybody does. But it's only through the challenges that we grow. It's only through the challenges and difficulties that we stretch. When we think of impossible, I mean, there's, there's the possible, there's the probable, and there's the impossible. Impossible is a word that um, my siblings gently tease me occasionally over family gatherings. You just tell him the word impossible. That's like a red flag for me. I'm off and going, trying to figure out how to do that. Not because it's easy, but because it's a challenge. Impossible. But there are some things in life that really seem impossible, aren't there? Some circumstances, some situations, there just doesn't appear to be any answers. So we're going to look at Mark, um, the book of Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Mark chapter 10, we're going to kind of wind our way through Mark chapter 10 to develop a few themes in Mark chapter 10 that as we go through it, don't seem to be directly related, but as they, un, uh, as they move from one, one story to the next, are all interconnected. And in a moment, you'll see why. But perhaps the greatest of Mark chapter 10 is a question that everyone asks at some point in their life. For you see in verse 17, and when he had gone forth in the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked, Good Master, being Jesus, what must I do that I might inherit eternal life? If you're going to ask any question of God, this is the paramount question, isn't it? What must I do to have eternal life. Of all the questions that you could ask, this is the paramount question. Jesus said on him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that 
is God. What must I do to inherit eternal life? We must, we must gather around that text for just a moment before we go into the story further. Because the question is, within the question is a statement. Because, because the question is framed thusly. What must I do to, what's the next word? Inherit eternal life. And I scratch my head. That really isn't a question in many, uh, in some sense, is it? Because I frame it in today's language. What would you do to receive your inheritance? What can you do to receive your inheritance? I see you brilliant ones. You're thinking of adding something to the oatmeal of the person that you're going to inherit from to speed up your inheritance. No, I wasn't going down that path. But the truth is, we can't do anything to receive our inheritance, can we? We just receive the inheritance. Nothing that we do earns the inheritance. In American law, you can disinherit your flesh and blood. Now, parents, <laughs> I know you wouldn't do this, but you can disinherit uh, your flesh and blood, but you cannot disinherit the blood that you have adopted. That's interesting from a couple of different angles. Because when we are called the sons and daughters of God, the scripture says we are adopted sons and daughters of God. Did you catch that all of a sudden? For some of you, it will come to you Tuesday or Thursday of next week. The subtle difference is, if you are an adopted child, the inheritance cannot be taken away. I like that, don't you? What can I do to inherit eternal life? I can't do anything but to receive the inheritance. However, However, the rich young ruler says, Thou knowest the commandments. He understood he should not commit adultery. He said, I do not kill, in verse 19. I do not steal. I do not bear false witness. I do not defraud. I honor my father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all of these things I have observed. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever you have, give to the poor. Thou shalt have a treasure in heaven, and come, take up your cross, and follow me. Just one little thing. Sell everything you have, Give to the poor and follow me. And I wish the next verse, I wish the next verse, if I could add a verse to the Bible, this is the one I would add. I would add a verse that says, the man's heart was filled with joy and he gave everything to Christ and followed him. But that's not how the Bible reads. And he was sad at that saying, and he went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Hmm. We often refer to this story as a story of the rich young ruler, sometimes, who had great possessions, but he didn't possess his possessions. His possessions possessed him. And we say, all oh, those rich people, we must take from them that we might have. When the truth is, if you have a positive bank balance today, you probably 
in world standards are considered part of the rich. Now let me ask, let me go from sharing God's word ever so carefully to speaking from my heart to your heart. Let's do a, kin a kinesthetic piece of learning today, can we? That means you hold and touch something. So if you're a guy, take out your wallet. We're not taking up an offering, relax. Take out your wallet, reach back, take out your wallet. If you're a lady, take out your purse. Let's just use this for an object illustration. Haven't done this before, don't know if it'll work. Reach into your wallet, everybody. You're gonna go home with everything you have, so. Reach into your wallet and pull out the biggest bill you have. The biggest bill, the one that you take to the hotel to pay the room charges. Yeah, you might need, uh, if you went to the ATM, it'll take several of the biggest bills that you will get from them. Take out the smallest bill, the smallest bill you have. It's a coin, that's fine. Come on, everybody, do it quickly. So put the smallest bill in your left hand and the biggest bill in your right hand. Smallest bill in your left, left or uh, left side of you, and the biggest bill on the right side of you. Okay? Now, which one do you like more? Which one do you like more? Come on. The right side, right? Hmm. Now, let me ask you a question. Which side do you often put in the offering? Ooh, why does he go there? Just saying, folks, we're pretty attached to it, aren't we? The left to right. Now let me ask you, when God looks down from heaven, what does he see in your hands? He sees ink and he sees paper. That don't mean much to him, right? Right? So how much of that on the left hand or the right hand are you taking with you when you check out? Not a nickel. Not a nickel. But it's a lesson of where our hearts are at times, isn't it? Are we possessing our possessions or are our possessions possessing us? So I ask you next week, when the offering comes, which side will you give? Let's move on in the lesson. For he was grieved because he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around. This is a case of how can I be right with Jesus? He looked around and said unto his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? But the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in their riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel go, to go through the eye of the needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Whew, I'm glad I'm not rich. Aren't you, friends? Let me tell you, if you have more at home than you have in your wallet, you're rich. Did you catch that? It's hard for us who have selfish hearts to get into the kingdom, not because we don't give, but because we have selfish hearts. And the eye of the needle is a gate in Jerusalem that only a man could go through, and to get a camel through it, it was very difficult. It wasn't impossible, but it was difficult. And the good news is it seems impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The camel goes through the eye of the needle. The rich man gets into heaven, not because of what they have done, but because of what Jesus has done and his ability to transform our selfish hearts. And we pick up his admonition to follow him. Jesus, looking upon, him, upon them, said, With men it is what? 
impossible, but with God, all things are possible. End of conversation. We're done. Almost. All right. So Peter goes on then and began to say, Lo, we have, uh, lo, we have all left and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, I say unto you there that no man has left uh, house or brethren or sisters or mother or father or wife or child or lands for my name's sake and the gospels, but shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses, brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands uh, with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. But many shall, uh, but many that are first shall be last and the last shall be what? First. He says, don't worry. Don't worry about what you give because it'll be returned to you and multiplied. First time that I gave my tithe in Seventh-day Adventist Church, I was working for almost minimum wage. It was a struggle. You see, I was making $1.15. Now, that dates me terribly, doesn't it? So I had to give 11 cents out of my hourly wage in tithe. I didn't have to, but God asked me to, and I said, if God wants me to do that, I'll do it. And then some more for offerings. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if I had never done that, if I'd be giving what I'm giving today, which is more than a hundredfold that, annually, at least. And I don't miss it. You see, I bought a lot of possessions that somehow they go from treasure to trash. And the only thing, the only thing that's between treasure and trash is time. That which catches our eye now, eventually we may not need in the future. And the habits that we pick up in accumulating are habits that may need to be modified in putting God first in our lives. You see, it's not about God needing our money. It's about our willingness to give. Because giving is a key part of God's character. Verse 32 says, And they were on their way going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus went before them, and they were amazed as they followed, and they were afraid. And he took, uh, he took again twelve and began to tell them the things that should happen, saying, Behold, we go up unto Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the priest and to the scribes, and they shall, be, they shall condemn him to death, and they shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they mocked him, and they shall scourge him and spit on him, and he shall rise the third day. And now, now, the impossible part, James, James and John decide, hmm, when we're in the kingdom, Lord, may I sit on your right side? If you have to sit uh, one on the right, one on the left, it's a desirable thing to be close to Christ. Grant that we might sit on the right hand and the other on the left. And Jesus said unto them, you know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I will drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I've been baptized with? And they said, we can. And Jesus said, you shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of and of the baptism that I am baptized. But to sit on my left hand and my right hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when, now here comes the division. Here's what happens sometimes in the church. We look around and say, who's favored? It's almost impossible sometimes to behold, as Christ's family, how divisions, how divisions come up. Two want to be primary here, and the other ten get to talking. What's up with that? How is it they're going to sit on the right and to the left? And, and how, is it, how is it that we might be left out? But so it shall be among you, that whosoever shall be great among you shall be what? Your minister. And whosoever shall be chief among you shall be your servant. And the Son of Man came not to be ministered, but to minister and to give his life for a ransom 
for many. It's almost impossible in any group of people to have complete harmony, but that the devil doesn't come in and cause discord and strife, and we get looking around. This person isn't like me. This person isn't of my heritage. This person isn't of my culture. And we see each other's differences more than we see the commonality of faith that we have. Do you find that to be the case? Do you find that to be the case in the world? Do you find that to be the case? Do you find it to be the case occasionally in the church? Do you find it to be the case occasionally in your heart? And animosity sets in, and somehow it's a wall that is created between relationships, an artificial wall, and that wall of separation creeps in. It happens in, the, it happens in personal relationships. It happens in corporate structures. It happens in church structures. We build up walls. I can be on this side of the wall, and if you don't think like, think like me, you must be on the other side of the wall. And I know my side of the wall is going to the kingdom and not quite sure about your side of the wall. Ever think like that? If they only knew how smart I was, they'd agree with me. My brother said once, he said, I believe everybody has the right to disagree with me and be wrong. That'll catch up with you on Wednesday. Um, however, the interesting connection here as Mark chapter 10 continues. In this apparent disagreement, even among the disciples, notice verse 40. As he says, if you're going to minister, you must be willing to serve if you're going to be in the kingdom. Not the ones you choose, but the ones Christ wants you to minister to. The interesting thing that I find, and it, it, it goes by you so quickly in verse 46, because it's not a a predominant theme in verse 46. And they came to, what does it say? Jericho, as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great number of people gathered around him. Interesting. Interesting. Jericho, Joshua, chapter 6. You know the story as well as I do. There were great walls around the city that divided those who were inside the city and those who were outside the city. God said, those walls have to come down. God's people on the outside, he instructed God's people, take up seven trumpets, seven priests, walk around the city once a day for six days. You know the story very well, don't you? And on the seventh day, now wait a minute, God, we're going to take this city and what is going to be our tools of warfare? A trumpet? Huh? How's that going to work? Six days. Once a day, they march around. On the seventh day, they march around once. Walls are standing. Twice. Third time around. Four, five, six. And on the seventh, they blew the trumpets as loud as they could. And you know the story, don't you? The walls came what? Tumbling, Tumbling down. I think, it's, I think it's delightful, absolutely delightful, that the writer of Scripture parenthetically throws, it, throws this in. And they came out of Jericho. Do you see the setup? There's a blind man who has a wall between him and God. There are the disciples who have walls between each other. And when we get to the kingdom, somebody's going to be greater than the other. Uh-uh, it's, it's just not going to happen, friends. Now, let me ask you, though. Let me ask you, as we worship here today, are there ever walls outside of this church between this church and the rest of God's people who are not here today. 
Are there walls of indifference? Walls of coldness? Walls of culture? Walls of segregation? Prejudice? Are there walls that God wants us? Walls of classification in the church? Are you conservative? Are you liberal? Do you read this? Do you read that? Do you think like I think? I'm not worried about who I think like unless my mind is focused on Christ. I'm not worried about what you think like only if you're not focusing your life on Christ. Does that make sense? Does that connect? Does that resonate? And on the seventh time around, the walls came tumbling down. So how is it on this, the seventh day of the week? Will the walls fall today? You see, it wasn't about money. It was about the wall of division between him and Christ. But within each of our hearts and each of our lives, we have walls that must come down. For those of you who have your possessions possessing you, that wall must come down. For those of you who hold pride and prejudice and want to be first, that wall must come down. For those of you that think anatomy plays a part in calling to ministry, those walls are not Christian walls. For those of you who think only the rich can control things, those walls need to come down. For those of you who would not feed the poor, help the sick, and do ministry for Christ, those walls must come down. And you might say, as the rich young ruler, I've done it all. I've done all of those things. But God says, those walls, those impossible walls need to come down by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if it's in this congregation, in the conference office, the union, the division, or the general conference. Listening to the voice of God and following that voice is our call. Well, we're in overtime. Best part of the sermon. Verse 52. Uh, and Jesus said, uh, as Jesus came to the blind man, he healed the blind man, blind man, blind Bartimaeus. And when he heard it was Jesus, uh, son of God, he cried out, have mercy on me. And as he, as he healed him, the blind man said unto the Lord, uh, he praised the Lord. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Hebrews chapter 6 says there are two things that it is impossible for God to lie about. Hebrews chapter 6. The sure salvation and hope that he gives us and the fact that he is our mediator in heaven. It's impossible for him to lie. You like the word impossible? I believe that for the Christian, the word impossible is changed by Christ to I am, and through I am being Christ, all things are possible. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. I don't know, friends, where you're at in your spiritual experience. What I know is as I read these words, I've got some work to do in my heart and in my life. That some attitudes I have that are taking up space and not paying rent in my mind need to go. Some behaviors I have need to change. Some of the thoughts of what I need and what God wants for my life need to come into harmony. In my relationships, some walls need to be torn down, and they don't come down. Might take a lot of prayer and a lot of marching, but it's coming into alignment with Christ's way for our lives, and that is only possible through Christ alone. May your walls come down, that your union with him might be strong that in the fullest he might live out his life 
in you.